That's very kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to dedicate this lecture to the memory of George W. Barlow, a uh, long-term faculty member here who recruited me here for my very first job as an extremely junior assistant professor and uh, was my guide and mentor during the time I was here. Can I begin with a little bit of research? The website in the middle there, richarddawkins.net, could I just have a show of hands for the number of people who've been there? Okay. Thank you, all right, that's fine, thank you very much. <laughs> Isn't it a remarkable coincidence? Almost everyone has the same religion as their parents. It always just happens to be the right religion. Religions run in families. If we'd been brought up in ancient Greece, we'd all be worshipping Zeus and Apollo. If we'd been born Vikings, we'd be worshipping Wotan and Thor. How does this come about? Well, of course, through childhood indoctrination. One by one, those ancient belief systems have vanished from the face of the earth, and we seem to get on just fine without them. Zeus with his thunderbolts, Apollo, Wotan, Thor with his hammer, Baal, Mithras, and Amun-Ra, all were once worshipped as gods. People believed in them, prayed to them, sacrificed to them. Children were brought up with them, told of their existence as a matter of undoubted fact. But nowadays, everybody agrees that no matter how sincere those believers undoubtedly were, they were deluded. Every one of those gods was a delusion and so were countless other gods that human tribes have sincerely believed in all around the world. Some of us just go one god further. My book is called The God Delusion, and I need to make it clear that the god I'm talking about is a personal, intelligent, creative being, like Yahweh, Allah, Be Baal, Wotan, Zeus, or Lord Krishna. But if by God you mean nature, goodness, the universe, the laws of physics, the spirit of humanity, or Planck's constant, we're going to be talking at cross purposes. An American student asked her professor whether he had a view about me. Sure, he replied, he's positive science is incompatible with religion, but he waxes ecstatic about nature and the universe. To me, that is religion. Well, if that's what you choose to mean by religion, fine, that makes me a very religious man. But if your God is a being who designs universes, listens to prayers, forgives sins, wreaks miracles, reads your thoughts, cares about your welfare or your sex life, <laughs> and raises you from the dead, then you're unlikely to be satisfied. As the distinguished American physicist Steven Weinberg said, if you want to say that God is energy, then you can find God in a lump of coal. But I would add, don't expect congregations to flock to your church. <laughs> this is sometimes called pantheistic religion. I call it Einsteinian religion. When Einstein said, did God have a choice in creating the universe, he meant, could the universe have begun in more than one way? God does not play dice, was Einstein's poetic way of doubting Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle. He Einstein did not believe in God. He did not believe in a personal God. He was irritated when people said that he did. But what did he expect? The hunger to misunderstand should have been palpable to him. Religious physicists, if you meet one, usually turn out to be so only in the Einsteinian sense. They are atheists of a poetic disposition, and so am I. But given the widespread yearning for that great misunderstanding, deliberately to confuse Einsteinian pantheism with supernatural religion is an act of intellectual high treason. Another example of Einsteinian religion, the Indian-American Nobel Prize winning physicist Subramanian Chandrasekhar said, this shuddering before the beautiful, this incredible fact that a discovery motivated by a search after the beautiful in mathematics should find its exact replica in nature 
persuades me to say that beauty is that to which the human mind responds at its deepest and most profound. The American physicist John Wheeler said, we will grasp the central idea of it all as so simple, so beautiful, so compelling, that we will all say each to the other, oh, how could it have been otherwise? How could we all have been so blind for so long? Don't forget, by the way, with all this talk of aesthetic beauty, beauty isn't enough. It must also be true. And that comes, finally, to evidence. Beauty may be a good guide to the stage of science where we put forward hypotheses, but those hypotheses must finally be tested. Carl Sagan said this, how is, it that any th how is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded this is better than we thought? The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. Instead they say, no, 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 my God is a little God and I want him to stay that way. A religion, old or new, that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Sooner or later, such a religion will emerge. Einsteinian religion, pantheistic religion, does not involve belief in anything supernatural. The pantheistic God doesn't exist, except in a purely poetic sense. Of those people who do believe in a supernatural God, many make a distinction between deism and theism. The deistic God designs the laws of physics and then retires never to be heard from again. <laughs> Certainly not interested in human affairs. The theistic interventionist God <laughs> There he is, he's parting the Red Sea there. <laughs> he intervenes in the world, intervenes in human affairs, performs miracles, answers prayers, and all that other list of things that I gave you earlier. There are many people who call themselves agnostic, and I want to clarify this, it's rather a confusing term. I put up here a scale of religiosity from one to seven, where one is, I know there is a God, and seven is, I know there is no God. And we've got a scale of intermediate agnostic positions in between. Four is exactly 50%. Number four agnostic believes that the probability of God existing and not existing is exactly equal. Number two is, I don't exactly know there's a God, but I have a very high Probability. I believe in a very high probability of there being a God. I'm a de facto theist. I can't know for certain, but I strongly believe in God and live my life on the assumption that he's there. Uh, a number six, at the other end, is somebody who believes there's a very low probability of God existing, but still not quite zero. I'm a de facto atheist. I can't know for certain, but I think God is very improbable, and I live my life on the assumption that he isn't there. I'm a number six. I'm an agnostic, but with the same level of belief in God as I have belief in fairies or unicorns. <laughs> Bertrand Russell illustrated this with his parable of the celestial teapot. Uh, he pointed out that it is impossible to disprove the hypothesis that there is a China teapot in orbit around Earth, or around the sun, between the orbits of Earth and Mars. We therefore all have to be agnostic about the teapot theory, but in practice we are all a teapotists. <laughs> I want to make it clear that the agnostic position does not, should not, be confused with an exact 50-50 probability position. There are people who quite wrongly and illogically say, you can neither prove nor disprove the existence of God, therefore there's an exactly 50% probability of God existing. It's like tossing a penny. That, of course, is completely illogical. 
Just because you cannot disprove something, and the, and the teapot example shows that, it doesn't mean the odds of it being there are 50%, and you can quickly see that with the example of the teapot. I regard the hypothesis of the existence of God as a scientific hypothesis. And in this, I disagree with many of my scientific colleagues who feel that science and religion have absolutely nothing to do with each other, and you could be a perfectly good scientist while your religious belief is a purely private matter that has nothing whatever to do with your science. I think that's wrong because a universe with a god would be a completely different kind of universe from one without, and the difference would be a scientific difference. God, by the way, could clinch the matter in a heartbeat in his favor if he chose to intervene, for example, at this very moment. <laughs> the only one of the traditional arguments for God that is still widely used today is the teleological argument, sometimes called the argument from design. It's the famous watchmaker argument. Surely one of the most superficially plausible bad arguments ever discovered. <laughs> and it's rediscovered by just about everybody until they learn the logical fallacy of it and or they learn Darwin's brilliant alternative. In the familiar world of human artifacts, things like watches, computers, complicated things that look designed are designed. To naive observers, it seems to follow that similarly complicated things in the natural world that look designed, things like eyes and hearts, are designed too. This is not just a bad argument by analogy, it's a bad argument by statistical reasoning as well. It's fallacious, but it carries an illusion of plausibility. If you randomly scramble the fragments of an eye or a heart a million times, you probably won't hit on one that can see or pump. This demonstrates that such devices could not have been put together by chance, by random chance. And there are many people who think that the only alternative to random chance is design. Because of the lamentable scientific education of most British and American students, There are many people who simply don't know what Darwinian natural selection is, and therefore the only alternative to chance that many people can imagine is design. The English astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle dramatized his own version of that misunderstanding. He suggested that a hurricane blowing through a junkyard would be as likely to assemble by luck a Boeing 747 as that natural selection could put together life as we know it. Even before Darwin came along and gave us the answer, the impotence of the argument from design was glaring. How could it ever have been a good idea to postulate as an explanation for the existence of complex, improbable things, a designer who would have to be even more complex and improbable than that which he's being invoked to explain? The entire argument is an obvious logical non-starter, as the great philosopher David Hume realized before Darwin was born. But what Hume, what Hume didn't know was this, this supremely elegant alternative to both chance and design that Darwin was to give to us. Natural selection is so stunningly powerful and elegant. It not only explains the whole of life, it raises our consciousness and boosts our confidence in science's future ability to explain probably everything else. Essentially, what's wrong with creationism, stroke intelligent design, there's no difference, by the way, is that it is what the philosopher Daniel Dennett calls a skyhook. A skyhook is a great hand that comes out of the sky, unexplained, and starts manipulating things in the world. And superficially, it looks as though this great hand is explaining something. But of course, it explains nothing, because it lacks an explanation itself. That's a skyhook. The opposite of a skyhook is a crane. A crane really does do explanatory work. 
Natural selection is the crane par excellence. Natural selection is cumulative. It starts from simple beginnings and works up by gradual degrees, incremental degrees, to the prodigious heights of complexity and improbability that we see in the living world. Here's a couple of examples of the products of natural selection, of the great crane of cumulative natural selection. On, on the right is a rose thorn, an adaptation by roses to avoid being eaten, and that thorn has been carved and shaped by natural selection over many generations. On the left, those are not rose thorns, those are bugs. They too have been carved and shaped by natural selection into the shape of a rose thorn as protection against their own predators. Natural selection is not just an alternative to chance, it's the only ultimate alternative to chance that's ever been suggested. Design is an, a workable alternative, but only in the short term, because you still have to explain where the designer came from. Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel, distinguished molecular biologists, once playfully speculated that life on this planet may indeed have been designed. This is their theory of directed panspermia, whereby an alien intelligence from outer space seeded our planet with a rocket in whose nose cone were bacteria. And that's where all of life sprang from. They didn't really believe that, but they put it forward as an interesting hypothesis. It's interesting from my point of view, because I see nothing wrong with it. It could, it could be right. It seems to be very unlikely, but it could be right. But whatever else you can say, it cannot be the ultimate explanation, because you still have to explain where the alien intelligences from outer space came from. Sooner or later, that regress has got to be terminated. If the aliens from outer space were themselves seeded by another rocket from a different planet, you still haven't solved the problem. Finally, you've got to terminate the regress by postulating a crane instead of a skyhook. And the obvious crane would be evolution by natural selection. The logic of creationist arguments is always the same. Some natural phenomenon is too statistically improbable, too complex, too beautiful, too awe-inspiring to have come into existence by chance. Design is the only alternative to chance that the author can imagine. Therefore, design must have done it. And science's answer to this faulty logic is also always the same. Design is not the only alternative to chance. Natural selection is a better alternative. Notice what rotten logic it is. We have theory A and theory B. Theory A is supported by loads of evidence. Theory B is supported by no evidence at all. Now here's the key step in the argument. Four. I can't understand how theory A explains phenomenon X. Therefore, theory B must be right. I bet you don't know how the elbow joint of the lesser spotted weasel frog evolved. You don't? Right then, God did it. <laughs> this kind of argument is a failure of the imagination. I've described it as the argument from personal incredulity. A metaphor for extreme improbability is a combination lock, a, a very good, high-quality combination lock of the kind that they put on bank vaults. A bank robber could theoretically get lucky and hit upon the right combination and therefore get all the money in the bank. But in practice, combination locks, at least the ones in bank vaults, are designed with enough improbability to make this tantamount to impossible, as unlikely as Fred Hoyle's spontaneous uh, coming into existence of a Boeing 747. But now imagine a badly designed combination lock, one that gives little hints, a bit like the childhood game of Hunt the Slipper, where you say, getting warmer, getting warmer, getting cooler, getting warmer, getting warmer. Suppose that 
Each time you turn the dial and you get a little bit closer to the correct combination, suppose that the bank vault door creaks open just a chink and a little bit of money spills out. <laughs> the dribbling combination lock, which of course the bank robber would instantly home in on the jackpot if he had that sort of clue. The dribbling combination lock is a better analogy for Darwinian evolution than the real bank lock, which offers only two poss possibilities, the jackpot or nothing. And the trouble with creationist arguments is that they all think that evolution by natural selection is a jackpot or nothing argument. Nothing could be further from the truth. But God, the God theory on the other hand, really is a jackpot or nothing argument. Because God is postulated as being there from the beginning, before the process of evolution got going. I can imagine God-like beings like the ones that Crick and Orgel postulated as seeding life from their planet to ours. I can imagine godlike beings, such that if we ever met them, I mean, if they came here, for example, in order to have got here, they would have to be godlike, because for sure we couldn't get there. I mean, they need to be technological wizards of a, of a sort that we have no, no comprehension of. We would worship them as gods, but they would not be gods because ultimately they would have uh, evolved by a gradual process. But the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, the God of the Muslims, who's always been there, he is the ultimate <laughs> 747. Well, why not teach the controversy? There are real controversies in science. They're interesting, and we should certainly teach them. Uh, it's a, a very important part of scientific education to understand that science is not a done deal, that scientists are constantly changing their minds as new evidence comes in. That's important. So let's, by all means, teach controversies that really are proper scientific controversies. But the controversy over so-called intelligent design versus evolution is just not a real controversy at all. I hope it's not pure wishful thinking to suggest that there is a new wave of reason sweeping across America, Britain, the whole of the Western world. One indication of this, perhaps, is a wave of best-selling books, which I'm happy to advertise. And perhaps even more significant is the backlash. And I uh, invite you to count along. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. The flea illusion you will, of course, recognize from W.B. Yeats, but was there ever dog that praised his fleas? Hence the flea powder that just got rid of that. <laughs> and a nice little afterthought. You... <laughs> you may not have seen the British edition, but that's a, uh, a, uh, that's a copy of the, of the cover design of the, of the British edition of The God Delusion. I'm not trying in this lecture to teach facts, and I'm certainly not trying to indoctrinate. I'm trying to raise consciousness. And we've all met the phrase consciousness raising in the context of feminism. It's especially powerful. 
There's no law against using a phrase like the rights of man or one man, one vote. Yet because we've all had our consciousness raised by feminists, most of us feel kind of uneasy when we hear people use a phrase like one man, one vote. And even those who still use man in that sort of sentence do so with their consciousness raised. They know what they're doing. They're taking a stand for traditional language, perhaps, or trying deliberately to rile feminists. But everybody, on one side or the other, has had their feminist consciousness raised. And I want to raise our consciousness about some unconscious assumptions we all make about religion. Let me try a little experiment on you. At Christmas time one year, my newspaper in Britain, The Independent, was looking for a seasonal picture. And they found a heartwarmingly ecumenical one at a school nativity play. The three wise men were played by Shadbreet, a Sikh, Musharraf, a Muslim, and Adele, a Christian, all aged four. Now, my guess is that you probably think that picture's rather sweet. How nice that four-year-olds who belong to different religions should come together in a nativity play. <laughs> now, suppose the caption said this, Shadbreet, a socialist, <laughs> Musharraf, a conservative, and Adele, a liberal, all aged four. <laughs> Shadbreet, an atheist, Musharraf, an agnostic, and Adele, a secular humanist, all aged four. I'm trying to raise consciousness. I hope that that series of three slides has raised your consciousness. I hope that every time from now on you hear anybody talking about, say, a Catholic child or a Protestant child or a Muslim child, you will protest. You will say, you wouldn't talk about a postmodernist child <laughs> or a Keynesian child or a Hayekian monetarist child. <laughs> there is no such thing as a Catholic child. There's only a child of Catholic parents. There's no such thing as a Protestant child. Only a child of Protestant parents. There's no such thing as a Muslim child. Only a child of Muslim parents. I repeat these slogans over and over again, probably too often. Too often? It can't be too often when you're in the business of consciousness raising. Please join me in protesting every time you hear anyone ever referring to a Catholic child, a Christian child, a Muslim child, etc. I like to think that this particular piece of consciousness raising has had some, uh, some effect. I'm now going to play you a short three-minute extract from a British comedian called Marcus Brigstock, um, and the, it's, it's quite funny. I hope you don't mind if I, I hope you don't take offence too. Um, uh, um, at, at the end of this, of this monologue, it, somebody's put, so, put sort of pictures onto it as well. I think it must originally have been on, on radio. Uh, at the end, I hope you'll get the, the same consciousness raising point that I've just made. So I'll start the, I hope the sound will come through. I'd like to start this week with a request, and this one goes out to the followers of the three Abrahamic religions, to the Muslims, Christians, and Jews. It's just a little thing, really, but do you think that when you've finished smashing up the world and blowing each other to bits and demanding special privileges while you do it, do you think that maybe the rest of us could sort of have our planet back? <laughs> um, I wouldn't ask, but the thing is, I'm starting to think there must be something written in the special books each of you so enjoy referring to that tells you it's all right to behave like precious, petulant, pugnacious pricks. <laughs> Forgive the alliteration, but your persistent power-mad punch-ups are pissing me off. <laughs> it's mainly the extremists, obviously, but not exclusively. It's a lot of mainstreamers as well. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, okay? Muslims. Listen up, my bearded and veily friends. Calm down, okay? Stop blowing stuff up. 
Not everything that's said about you is an attack on the Prophet Muhammad and Allah that needs to end in the infidel being destroyed. Have a cup of tea, put on a Cat Stevens record, sit down and chill out. <laughs> I mean, seriously, what's wrong with a strongly worded letter to the Times? <laughs> Christians, you and your churches don't get to be millionaires while other people have nothing at all. They're your bloody rules. Either stick to them or abandon the faith. And stop persecuting and killing people you judge to be immoral. Oh, and stop pretending you're celibate as a cover-up for being a gay or a nonce. <laughs> Right, that's two ticked off. Jews! I know you're God's chosen people and the rest of us are just whatever, but when Israel behaves like a violent, psychopathic bully and someone mentions it, that doesn't make them anti-Semitic. And for the record, your troubled history is not a license to act with impunity now. So, when the letters come, and I'm guessing they will, <laughs> I can guarantee that each one of those faiths will be utterly convinced that I've singled them out for special criticism. Why did it have to be us? Islam is a peaceful faith. I don't see what's wrong with being Christian. We're a peaceful, loving faith. How dare you after all we've been through? We Jews know how terrible violence can be. You see, all of them will be convinced that they're the ones being picked on. The Abrahamic faiths are like scousers. They're always convinced they're it's harder than everyone else. <laughs> Right? And why is it that all of these faiths claim to be peaceful when even the most fleeting glance at a history of warfare will tell you otherwise? The relationship between religion and warfare is very similar to the relationship between ant and deck. You could have one without the other, but I'm not sure anyone would see the point. <laughs> actually like it, but it would at least be refreshing to hear one of them come out and say, Oh, I'll fight as violent as you like. We'll have a scrap, us lot. We do. Honestly, our special book says fight, fight, kill, maim, fight, smash, destroy, fight, murder, kill, and fight. That's why I signed up, to be honest. I'm a bit naughty, you know what I mean? <laughs> but no, all of them claim to be peaceful religions. Yeah, peaceful right up to the point where someone takes something they think is theirs, or says the wrong thing, or looks at them funny, then it's fighty, smashy, kicky, punchy all the way. <laughs> I know this will upset a lot of people, and frankly, I don't care. I'm getting so sick of religious people screwing it up for the rest of us. Please don't kill us. Seriously. As far as I'm concerned, this is the only chance we get. When we die, it's all over. There's no virgins and pearly gates waiting for us, no big beardy man saying... Right, so uh, how do you think that went, then? Um, <laughs> mix? mix? Uh, ooh, killed a lot of people in my name, I see. Yeah, yeah, not really what I had in mind, actually. Um, tell you what, have another go as a worm. <laughs> While we're at it, I'm sick of religious people forcing their children to define themselves by their parents' faith. A four-year-old is no more a Christian than he is a member of the Postal Workers' Union. <laughs> we want a fair working wage, decent working conditions, and time allotted to see the new Transformers film. <laughs> Said a spokesman. Another piece of consciousness raising. You've all seen maps of the world showing what people believe in different places. In the blue area, they're Catholic. In the red area, they're Protestant. In the orange area, they're Eastern Orthodox. In the green area, they're Sunni, Muslim, and so on. And we all take that perfectly for granted. It seems entirely natural that people's opinions about the cosmos, about morality, about humanity, should depend upon the accident of geography where they happen to have been born. Suppose scientists worked like that. <laughs> Take a difficult and interesting scientific issue. Take, for example, the question of what made the dinosaurs go extinct. Was it an asteroid hitting the Earth? Was it a comet? Was it the rise of the mammals? Was it a plague of viruses? All these different theories have something going for them. In the blue area, <laughs> the scientists all believe that it was a meteorite. In the red area, they believe it was a comet. In the orange area, a virus plague. In the green area, the eggs of the dinosaurs were all eaten, etc. <laughs> I hope yet again to have raised consciousness. We all take for granted that it's okay for religion to be distributed geographically in that kind of way. And yet we immediately see, when, you, when I show you a map like this, how totally ridiculous that is. 
Why do we all accept it as though it were natural and sensible and the way things should be? Here's another exercise in consciousness raising, again using the example of the scientific controversy over what made the dinosaurs go extinct. The Quarterly Review of Biology is a journal in which biologists publish their findings, their research. I'm, I have edited an imaginary spoof issue of the Quarterly Review of Biology, devoted, as they sometimes are, to a particular topic, namely the topic, did an asteroid kill the dinosaurs? The first paper would be a perfectly respectable and normal scientific paper. Iridium layer at KT boundary and potassium argon dated crater in Yucatan indicate that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Nobody would be surprised to see a paper like that in any scientific journal. The president of the Royal Society has been vouchsafed a strong inner conviction that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. It has been privately revealed <laughs> to Professor Huxdane that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. <laughs> Professor Haldley has been brought up to have total and unquestioning faith <laughs> that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. <laughs> Professor Hawkins has promulgated an official dogma binding on all loyal Hawkinsians <laughs> that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Professor Huxkins is personally offended by all strident, shrill, and polemical denials that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Professor Hallux derives deep personal comfort <laughs> from his belief that an asteroid killed the dinosaurs. The president of the National Academy of Sciences has issued a fatwa I'm now going to switch gears and look at a couple of criticisms that the hardback God Delusion encountered. Uh, and I've mentioned these in the preface to the paperback, which is now uh, just out. Interestingly, some of the strongest criticisms came from atheists who, although they don't believe themselves, believe in belief, as the philosopher Dan Dennett puts it. I'm an atheist, but I wish to dissociate myself from your shrill, strident, intemperate, intolerant, ranting language. Well, actually, if you look at the language of the God Delusion, it's rather less shrill or intemperate than we regularly, regularly take in our stride when listening to political commentators, for example, theatre critics or book critics or restaurant critics. Here are some quotes from restaurant criticisms of London restaurants in the leading papers recently. It is difficult, if not impossible, to imagine anyone conjuring up a restaurant, even in their sleep, where the food in its mediocrity comes so close to inedible. <laughs> All things considered, quite the worst restaurant in London, maybe the world, serves horrendous food grudgingly in a room that is a museum to Italian waiters' taste, Kirker 1976. <laughs> the worst meal I've ever eaten, not by a small margin, I mean the worst, the most unrelievedly awful. What looked like a sea mine in miniature was the most disgusting thing I put in my mouth since I ate earthworms at school. <laughs> well, insulting a restaurant might seem trivial compared to insulting God, but restaurateurs and chefs really exist, and they have feelings to be hurt. <laughs> Whereas blasphemy, as the witty bumper sticker puts it, is a victimless crime. Another example. In 1915, the British Member of Parliament, Horatio Bottomley, recommended that after the war, if by chance you should discover one day in a restaurant you were being served by a German waiter, you will throw the soup in his foul face. If you find yourself sitting at the side of a German clerk, you will spill the ink pot over his foul head. Now that's strident and intolerant. <laughs> and I should have thought ridiculous and ineffective as rhetoric, even in its own time. The British literary critic 
Terry Eagleton described the late Kingsley Amis, extremely distinguished novelist, as a racist, anti-Semitic bore, a drink-sodden, self-hating reviler of women, gays, and liberals. Well, I think that compares fairly well with my own beginning of chapter two of The God Delusion, which is the passage most often quoted as strident or shrill. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> now, that's the passage most often quoted as strident or shrill. It's not for me to say whether I succeeded, but my intention was closer to robust humor, <laughs> a humorous broadside, rather than shrill polemic. I don't think words like misogynistic, infanticidal, genocidal, megalomaniacal, that doesn't sound shrill to me. Something about those long words suggests that... <laughs> My wife, Lala, and I do a, a sort of double act reading from my books when they're published. And one of the things you have to do in order to warm an audience up is to get them laughing early. And so with each book, we try to pick a humorous passage near the beginning, and we always pick that passage for the God delusion. It, it, it sort of gets a laugh. As, as, as this, this one is another one, um, which at least was my intention to be humorous, um, about Our Lady of Fatima. Um, and there you see some typical examples of Catholic kitsch. <laughs> <laughs> this is a quote from The God Delusion now. Pope John Paul II created more, more saints than all his predecessors of the past several centuries put together, and he had a special affinity with the Virgin Mary. His polytheistic hankerings were dramatically demonstrated in 1981 when he suffered an assassination attempt in Rome and attributed his survival to intervention by Our Lady of Fatima. A maternal hand guided the bullet. One cannot help wondering why she didn't guide it to miss him altogether. <laughs> Others might think the team of surgeons who operated on him for six hours deserved at least a share of the credit but perhaps their hands, too, were maternally guided. The relevant point is that it wasn't just Our Lady who, in the Pope's opinion, guided the bullet, but specifically Our Lady of Fatima. Presumably Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Guadeloupe, Our Lady of Medjugorje, Our Lady of Akita, Our Lady of Zaitun, Our Lady of Garabandal, and Our Lady of Nock were busy on other errands at the time. <laughs> I think that's quite funny, too. Uh, pure Monty Python. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's quite true that many people do feel very strongly about their faith and very offended if you insult it. Uh, we've come to expect never to be offended. What you say is offensive to me. The novelist Douglas Adams, to whom The God Delusion is dedicated, picked out exactly what's going on here in a wonderful speech, an impromptu speech that he made in Cambridge uh, not long before he died, and I was privileged to be there. Fortunately, somebody had the blessed good sense to switch on a tape recorder, and so this priceless hour or so of Douglas just holding forth impromptu is preserved. And I'm going to read a, a passage from it, because he, he puts his finger exactly on what's going on with all this offence. Religion has certain ideas at the heart of it which we call sacred or holy or whatever. What it means is, here is an idea or a notion that you're not allowed to say anything bad about. You're just not. Why not? Because you're not. <laughs> if somebody votes for a party that you don't agree with, you're free to argue about it as much as you like. Everybody will have an argument, but nobody feels aggrieved by it. 
If somebody thinks taxes should go up or down, you're free to have an argument about it. But on the other hand, if somebody says, I mustn't move a light switch on a Saturday, you say, I respect that. <laughs> Why should it be that it's perfectly legitimate to support the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, Republicans or Democrats, this model of economics versus that, Macintosh instead of Windows? <laughs> but to have an opinion about how the universe began, about who created the universe, no, that's holy. We are used to not challenging religious ideas, but it's very interesting how much of a furore Richard creates when he does it. Everybody gets absolutely frantic about it because you're not allowed to say these things. Yet when you look at it rationally, there is no reason why those ideas shouldn't be as open to debate as any other, except that we've agreed somehow between us that they shouldn't be. And that agreement seems to extend to the non-religious as well as the religious. Let's raise our consciousness. What's so special about religious arguments that they should be immune to exactly the same kind of rational discussion as political or any other kind of argument? I'm offended by some things. I'm offended by chewing gum. I'm offended by backwards pointing baseball hats. <laughs> but I don't try to get a version of the blasphemy law passed to prevent people chewing gum or reversing their cap. So what if I'm offended? So what if my feelings are hurt? Does that give me the right to prevent others from expressing their opinions? However, is there a time when it is right to be offended? I think so, yes. yes. We should be offended when children are denied a proper education. <laughs> we should be offended when children are told they will spend eternity in hell. <laughs> we should be offended when medical science, for example, stem cell research, is compromised by... <laughs> Compromised, I should say, by the bigoted opinions of powerful and, above all, well-financed ignoramuses. <laughs> we should be offended when voodoo of all kinds is given equal weight to science. We should be offended by hymen reconstruction surgery. <laughs> we should be offended by female circumcision, euphemism for genital mutilation. This, this picture was taken in Africa, but it happens in Britain. I had a, a long conversation with a school's inspector from London, and she told me it's common. Girls are typically sent away to stay with an uncle in Bradford. We should be offended by stoning. This young Kurdish woman was stoned to death in a so-called honor killing because she wanted to marry a young man of the wrong religion. I mentioned the novelist Kingsley Amis a moment ago. His son, Martin Amis, is an equally distinguished novelist. And he made a very important point. Secularism contains no warrant for action. One can afford to be crude about this. When Islamists crash passenger planes into, into buildings or hack off the heads of hostages, they shout, God is great. When secularists do that kind of thing, what do they shout? A critic of Martin Amis's book remarked upon, on this. That question is meant to be rhetorical, but there's a simple answer. They shout, secularists shout, Heil Hitler. <laughs> what a truly outrageous thing to say. Whether or not Hitler was a Roman Catholic, the evidence is contradictory, he often said he was, Nobody could deny that Hitler's soldiers were as Christian as everybody else was in Europe at the time, and that means that most of them were, mostly either Roman Catholic or Lutheran. But even if Hitler was an atheist, so what? Hitler was also a vegetarian. <laughs> Does that suggest that vegetarians have a special tendency to be murderous, bigoted racists? The point is that there is a logical pathway leading from religion to the committing of atrocities. 
It's perfectly logical. If you believe that your religion is the right one, you believe that your God is the only God, and you believe that your God has ordered you, through a priest or through a holy book, to kill somebody, to blow somebody up, to fly a plane into a skyscraper, then you are doing a righteous act. You're a good person. You're following your religious morality. There is no such logical pathway leading from atheism or secularism to any such atrocious act. It just doesn't follow. Now, it's sometimes said that humans need religion, even if it isn't true. They need the comfort of religion. I think there's something rather patronizing about that, rather condescending about it, but that's what people say. Often atheists say it. Of course, you and I are too intelligent to need religion. But what about all those poor people out there who need the comfort of religion? Humanity's need for comfort is, of course, real. But isn't there something childish, something infantile, in the belief that the universe owes us comfort, in the sense that if something is comforting, that must kind of make it true? Isaac Asimov's remark about the infantilism of pseudoscience is just as applicable to religion. He said, inspect every piece of pseudoscience, and you will find a security blanket, a thumb to suck, a skirt to hold. And it is astonishing how many people are unable to understand that X is comforting does not imply X is true. A related plaint concerns the need for a purpose in life. To quote one Canadian critic, the atheist may be right about God, who knows? But God or no God, it's clear that something in the human soul requires a belief that life has a purpose that transcends the material plane. One would think that a more rational than thou empiricist such as Dawkins would recognize this unchanging aspect of human nature. Does Dawkins really think that this world would be a more humane place if we all looked to the God delusion instead of the Bible for truth and comfort? Actually, yes. <laughs> Since you mention humane, yes, I do. But I must repeat yet again that the consolation content of a belief does not raise its truth value. I can't deny the need for emotional comfort. And I can't claim that the worldview adopted in my book offers any more than moderate comfort. If you're afraid of death, for example, you might superficially think that a priest who tells you that you're not really going to die would be more comforting than a scientist who tells you it is highly implausible that our individuality could survive the decay of our brains. But I have heard... I have heard experienced nurses who've worked all their lives in old people's homes say that the ones who are most terrified of death tend to be the Roman Catholics. <laughs> all that guilt fed from the cradle up and the terror of purgatory and hell. As for eternal nothingness, it's, is it really all that frightening? As Mark Twain said, I do not fear death. I'd been dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and had not suffered the slightest inconvenience. From <laughs> In any case, I don't think I've ever met anyone at a funeral who dissents from the view, my view, that the non-religious parts, the eulogies, the deceased's favorite poems or music, those non-religious parts are always more moving than the prayers. I want to end by reading the opening lines of a previous book of mine, Unweaving the Rainbow. These are lines that I've long earmarked for my own funeral. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place 
but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Sahara. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively outnumbers the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I, in our ordinariness, that are here. We privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds, how dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred. Thank you very much.